Welcome, Roman. Here you know a little bit about us. Brian couldn't join us today. He's the naturopathic physician who has UC, who's also healing naturally. He's um, on a flight back from New York. Um, I think there were some snow issues. So everyone knows who you are, Roman. I gave him a, head, a heads up in the emails. And thank you for spending this time with us from the, I think, the jungles of Peru. Did I get that right? Well, actually, right now it's uh, in the Andean mountains, and our center is on the border between the Andes and the cloud forest. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm grateful that the weather held up. And uh, yeah, yeah, it seems to have stabilized. We were thinking he may have to call in if the video was taken down. So uh -huh. God allowed it to happen, spirit allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me here. It, it's, I tuned in, seems like mid-conversation, but it's been good to just tune in and connect to everyone. I definitely resonate with um, everything I've been hearing so far. As I shared with you guys, just so in case you didn't catch the email, the Israeli healthcare system, the American healthcare system, and even Chinese medicine wasn't sufficient. And so he was intuitively guided, I believe, through different relationships to wind up in, uh, in Peru and learn from the indigenous healers, which is what you now um, not only practice, but teach. Hmm. Yeah, it's been, I see that everything has been useful at its own time and it's been a, a culminational type of a process. And of course, uh, first and foremost, an inner journey of uh, reconciling my life and uh, just uh, recognizing the wake up call that came to me through the illness that I have encountered early on in my life and uh, uh, also see it, uh, see it as a blessing in disguise. I think you, you share something similar. So definitely that's been a big part of my process is to actually come out of certain stereotypes that relate to disease or that uh, relate to just this uh, western model of some kind of a random experience and i'm a victim of my circumstances and so to actually come out of that and see that uh, there is deep meaning within that process and it has to do with evolutionary uh, healing and that's how people in uh, the rainforest that work with this healing approach relate to it as is that uh, there is always a message that is coming through and it's not uh, a message that comes through the words necessarily i mean sometimes it may be translated into words but uh, the message comes through in uh, this uh, need to move beyond a certain uh, stagnant state of development and recognize how one can actually cultivate certain essential human qualities or I can even say uh, remember them. In the Amazonian tradition, that has to do with remembrance. So remembering certain original states of being from the time that each one of us has been in the mother's womb and experienced a state of profound connection, openness, where there was no separation. And uh, within that vulnerability, innocence, then uh, the power of nature is able to come through. And so in today's society, and I can definitely share it through my own experience, this original human quality, such as uh, vulnerability, innocence, tenderness, um, they often are associated with woundedness. And woundedness is perceived in a negative light. So if I'm innocent or tender or vulnerable, it means that somebody can take advantage of me and uh, somebody can harm me. And so uh, there's a certain... Uh, label that goes along with it. Okay, if I'm sick, something is wrong with me. I'm not supposed to experience this pain. And actually, our body is designed to feel pain. That's 
something that is embedded into our new nervous system. But it's this kind of negative story that goes along with it, that just perpetuates it and uh, misses the point. So instead of the body healing, then there is that kind of uh, mentality of scarcity, separation. I don't have what it takes to be fully present with the experience of my life. So to me, that uh, relates to the spiritual process, but in a very straightforward way. Also, I agree with some of the people that shared. It's not about some kind of a visualization or um, something um, outside of my everyday life that has to take place. It's uh, this uh, ordinary miracle to be fully open and present with each moment. And it's not easy. Definitely some moments I enjoy and some moments I would rather eat a cookie or something. Right. So uh, it is a practice of bringing that into each moment. And the spirit in these traditions is considered to be more real and tangible than everything that is material. So all of the um, animals, trees, insects, people come and go. And at the same time, the life itself is perpetual. And to tune in into that spirit of life and to open the heart to all beings then um, allows that spirit to really come through. So I guess that's a little something that I can share. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned the, the negative story that goes with the pain. And mm -hmm. um, last week, Brian's not here right now, but Brian had a, a bathroom incident in the airport on the way when he was traveling home. And Cassandra is right now in a flare. So, you know, those create negative stories. So what, what's a good tip for someone to, you know, cancel <laughs> that story and move forward in a, in a more helpful way when you're experiencing pain or bathroom, some negative physical thing? Mm. Well, um, a big part of it is in my experience and something that I have found uh, of uh, a lot of uh, support from the people that I've worked with is this recognition of oneself in others and others in oneself. So if I'm going through something that is very challenging to see that others might be going through something even more challenging and not to just uh, lock in into my own particular circumstances or the drama of my own life, but uh, to actually see that, okay, I'm actually going through this so that others maybe don't have to. And uh, in that way, it's possible to come out of the story, to see that, yeah, the pain that I'm experiencing, that's not what makes me so special. The challenges and difficulties that I'm going through in my life, that's not what makes me. I used to think that that's what made me special, that no one else experiences this kind of pain. No one else experiences that kind of embarrassment. I definitely have pooped myself once or twice in my life on my way to work in New York City before I got to the Amazon rainforest. And uh, yeah, there was a certain, in a way, um, just um, almost solace that I found in, in that pain or in that sickness, just uh, feeling like that, that is what made me feel that I am someone, that I'm special, that this illness uh, gave me a certain identity a sense of identity and then starting to see that actually um, everyone is going through their own challenges and everyone has their share and um, that's not really what makes me special but how I can actually engage with that and then that is not don't, not really special but it's more uh, this uh, process of recognizing the unique contribution that I can bring into the collective process. Just by not going into that, um, into that rabbit hole. Yeah. 
of those same old patterns and reactions and uh, this kind of sickness of humanity in the way that um, the healers that I worked with look at it is this coin of two sides. On one side is the self-pity, is this poor me, the whole world is against me, nothing is working out, I have this issue and I've, I don't deserve it and I'm a victim of my circumstances. And on the other side is, but I'm so special. I deserve so much more. I am so important. And it's the same coin of two sides that just keeps flipping and takes up a lot of energy that otherwise could be utilized for the healing of the organism. And so in my own process, it was a lot about that. It's just recognizing that, um, um, yeah, it was a certain personality construct that was not really directing and guiding the energy of life in a way that was uh, revitalizing, in a way that was regenerating and wasting all this energy on the inner drama. And so a lot of it had to do with recognizing it and seeing how it may be still going on, but I don't have to feed into that. Right. And I can just see that, yeah, it's just this circus show that is going on and I don't have to keep giving credit to that. Yeah, good, great tips. And what's useful for me, I have found in those moments of places I would rather be than in physical pain has been, uh, where can I find gratitude in this situation? As gnarly as it is, as gross and embarrassing and humbling, where can I find gratitude? And, you know, when we come from a place of, of like not being in pain, the, the gratitude meter might be larger, but when we're living a smaller life because we're stuck in bed or something, or I'm stuck in bed, then the gratitude meter gets smaller, but it really doesn't matter in my experience what you're having gratitude for, but you're shifting the attention away from woe is me to having gratitude for something and kind of building, building the, the gratitude um, tree, the, the gratitude um, healing modality has been helpful mm. for me. Um, so Roman, I, two people already have mentioned dreams and I know mm -hmm. that was a big part of our interview for the Crohn's and Colitis Summit. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your, hear your thoughts. So Kent mentions spirit communicates through synchronicity and dreams as well. And Jenny mentioned that she used to do a lot of dream work, but now having difficulty remembering. And that's mm -hmm. where I am as well. It's challenging for me to always remember my dreams. So can you mm -hmm. speak to the relevance of dreams and how we can use it to our advantage? Sure, I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, before going to the Amazon rainforest 18 years ago, I was uh, actually, um, for a few years, I was studying uh, Jungian transpersonal psychology and I had the intention of uh, actually going to Zurich and applying to that school. And of course, life has had other plans. But um, I initially started with that because Crohn's disease and my gastroenterologist initially told me that it's very psychosomatic and I noticed how uh, different degrees of stress and all kinds of conflicts in my life would actually trigger very painful episodes. And uh, so I started investigating that and uh, going into transpersonal psychology and uh, going into the study of dreams. And then of course, coming into the Amazon rainforest and um, one of my uh, main healers and teachers was an Ashuar elder. And uh, the Ashuar people, they work specifically with the dream language. And uh, when I came to the Amazon rainforest, I was still looking at it in a more conceptual way where the dreams, there are certain archetypes, certain messages, but it was hard for me to see it in a more embodied manner. And then living alongside with the Ashuar people and seeing how for them, um, it was something that was uh, very embodied. So the dreams would uh, represent certain ways of being. And then of course, everything to them is a dream. Every individual, every person has certain qualities, associations, characters, just like you were sharing where you were in meditation. And that's when I just tuned in. Um, but that's what I caught uh, and 
suddenly connecting to this one person and another person, but for the indigenous people, uh, their main precept in life is when they meet each other, they say hello me to each other. They see that everyone is a unique expression of that greater whole. And then each individual represents certain qualities, characteristics, essential states of being that we can all relate to. And this is something that definitely is happening in dreams and especially through the patterns in dreams and seeing a few dreams, it's possible to recognize those patterns and see very clear communication that is coming through on an evolutionary level. The communication for the indigenous people also the greater organism, right? You can call it the spirit of the rainforest or the great spirit, uh, God, however you wish to call it, Buddha nature. It's this great organism that uh, everyone are a part of. And this greater organism, of course, our own body is a fractal holographic expression of that greater organism. There are so many processes happening in our body and they may initially be seem so disconnected from each other, but they're all working together and each one of us is experiencing this body as a whole. And so for the indigenous people, the more that we can tune in into this greater organism within our immediate environment, in our everyday life, the more we can actually experience greater harmony within our own physical organism. And the dream language is very much related to that. So in our institute, we work um, a lot with uh, this recognition of the language, how this language is coming through random pains in our lives, illnesses, diseases, experiences, situations, all kinds of uh, encounters, people in our lives. And so how from early age, nothing was random. And so then gradually starting to see how there is a very profound organic intelligence in every experience of our lives and every moment. And then through that, a lot of healing comes through. So it's uh, in a way understanding the language of nature, the language of our own organism, working with the energy of our feelings, of our emotions, working with the energy of each moment, how to be more and more open to be a conduit of life rather than to be at odds with it. So that's what I can say in, in short. Great. Um, and did I, um, did you have a presentation? I, I, I didn't check in with you, I apologize. Um, did you have a presentation or something you wanted to share or would you prefer to do a active Q&A like we're doing here? Yeah, I'm, I prefer to do active q and I'm not so good with presentations. I'm more of a just Great. talking kind of guy. <laughs> awesome. per per perfect. Um, so Kiran, um, so everyone, as, as questions come up, as thoughts come up, just drop it in the, uh, the chat box um, on the right or if you have a chat button on the bottom. Um, so Kiran just asked, how does spiritual, spirituality help you to trust the process of life? For example, to make decisions. How can you move from acting out of fear to acting out of trust? Mm. Well, um, for me, I can say that I had to get to a pretty desperate place in my life <laughs> where I had nothing else to lose. And so then from that place of having nothing else to lose, then I could actually move forward. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I came to a place where, okay, there, were, there was not much else for me to do. I've tried everything that I could in a conventional way to deal with my issues and it wasn't working. And then basically I was facing um, continuous surgeries and, uh, and all, it wasn't only physical in my life, but just everything in my life started to break down. I started seeing how... I could not find deep meaning in my life, deep fulfillment, and uh, then was being very miserable as a result of that. And so that made me really start to question everything. 
and uh, to question uh, everything that I have thought I was and everything that I thought this life should be. And uh, then I started to really investigate and see what is possible. And um, yeah, it was this kind of uh, sense of uh, despair, I guess. And at the same time, of course, also just this deep spirit that I can, I could recognize later on at that time, I just felt that something was pushing me beyond that something deep inside me knew that there was more to this life than what I was experiencing. And then starting to take those steps. And initially it was just very deep hole of just misery, depression, uh, lack of purpose, meaning. And uh, then at a certain point, it was kind of like this, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so the, the trust in my life, it, it was never this kind of blind faith type of experience. The, the trust came from the exploration, from the recognition of what is possible. And so then the more that I was able to see that there is more to life, that there is more to what I thought I was, the more I was able to trust this process a little bit more and a little bit more. And so then gradually uh, it started to unfold. Kiran, was that helpful? Do you have any additional follow-up? Uh, yeah, that was very helpful. Um, I'm, this is something that I'm learning to do because um, I'm, I'm the type of personality that I like to be in control of things. And I've had situations come up where I, I cannot really control. And um, I would find myself like, you know, being reactive or trying to think about every possible scenario. And um, I'm learning to like let go of the control button and, and trust. Um, that was something that I got a message from um, a pastor of mine. Uh, but it's, it's not easy. Um, so it, I'm still developing this skill. I'm just starting to, to, to explore this, um, this option. So yes, thanks for that answer. Yeah, surrender mm -hmm. is the big part really. of the journey. Is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm also just starting. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's been a while and at the same time, uh, yeah, there, I can definitely relate. It's a continuous process and it doesn't necessarily get easier, but I do get better at it over time. So can you give me some ways that you, what do you use to like center yourself when you feel like for me, I feel like, um, I feel frazzled and overwhelmed when I'm dealing with a situation that I don't have control of, but I need to like, like I do meditate and that helps to like bring me back to center where I can look at things from a different perspective. Um, do you have a specific example that you want to share maybe? Examples of like a situation that I'm dealing with. Yes. So I, right now I'm trying to decide if I need to change my functional doctor and um, I'm looking at different options and I feel like I've been like a guinea pig um, just experimenting with different methods. And I feel like if I, if I stop, then, you know, my health will deteriorate, but I feel like my body's also telling me I need to change, but I just don't know what, which way to go. And I, I'm mm. feeling very overwhelmed by it. So I, I would like some tools, like how can I use spirituality to help, to guide me into a, making a better decision or the right decision. Mm. I mean, for, so I'll just jump in. For me, I've been there as well. And for me, I trust my intuition more than anything. And sometimes it's spot on and sometimes it's a painful lesson, but I'm happier for making that decision. And so for me, the, like, for example, when I was running Crohn's.net, 
which doesn't exist anymore, but I was learning that with a doctor, Dr. Pam Nathan. It got to a point, I'll never forget the moment, I was at a salsa club downtown and my whole body was like, you have to get out. You, you, you've you evolved this this contract and you've helped her enough and I seriously helped her sales, but it, and she wanted to give me her company. Like I, this could have been my, my, my whole purpose, my whole journey, and it just wasn't aligned for me. And so in the moment, in the middle of the club, I stepped aside and called her. I said, Dr. Pam, I love you. We talk tomorrow, but we need to change something. So I knew I had to act really quick. And it wasn't the best financial decision at that time because that was my number one client. I dedicated a lot to her. But it, I knew for my soul, I needed to move on. And I jumped just like I left engineering. I left that relationship without knowing what was next. And it kind of, it showed up as fast as I recognized what was the next thing. So one thing I would potentially ask you is if you're looking to leave your current functional medicine doctor and you're looking to maybe find another one, there's one on this call right now. So it's just, I don't know, like, it's kind of funny, right? It, it could be a joke, right? But I mean, like, you're asking and here's some, so I don't know if that's the right uh, thing. I, I, I know, I didn't know that she was going to be joining tonight. So I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, is this like a sign from the universe? I don't know. Because with me, I feel like sometimes, you know, like the universe has to knock me over the head for me to see what it's trying to show me. So. Well, Maybe the more you um, say know. that, but maybe the more you say that, the more it's going to require knocking you over the head. And sometimes they're, sometimes they're subtle. Right, right, right. And I'm learning. <laughs> I, 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 I'm learning the different, you know, it's definitely, um, it doesn't have to be flashing lights in front of my face, but it can be subtle, um, subtler ways of nudging and, you know, so I, I guess I'm new, like I, I'm always praying but um, I've started to kind of switch the way I pray or what my expectations of prayer is. Like not just asking for something out there to help me, but also like to have a, uh, a relationship with it where I am a part of the process as well. Like I'm actively involved. Right. Roman, do you have any, I, that was my response to her and fear and trust and surrender. Do you have a, hmm. uh, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I definitely relate with your response. And um, I like what you shared about the intuition and also discovering what that intuition is. And it's also a process of getting to know oneself. I think there is that uh, quote, know thyself and you'll enter the kingdom of heaven, something like that. Um, yeah, also in regards to trust, since we've been talking about that team, one thing that I've learned that I can trust, one thing that I can truly trust in this life is that there's always something to learn in each situation, each experience. And um, within um, our approach, uh, also an essential point is that there is no wrong. There is no wrong. Of course, it doesn't mean that anything goes, but it means that th there can be either ignorance or wisdom. And then if I don't make it wrong, then naturally ignorance will lead into wisdom. So there is that capacity to be open to the experience. And so, yeah, sometimes I make um, ignorant choices, but they're not wrong because I can learn from them and then I can mature and evolve in that way. So uh, sometimes people come to me and ask me for, you know, some kind of like a, a bag full of tricks, so to speak. But in, in the approach that I have engaged in my life, there is no bag of tricks. There is no magical bullet. It is something that uh, has to do with a relationship with life. A relationship with the spirit, with oneself, a, a disposition towards life. And uh, that's the essential training, nothing else. I can have the most enlightening, blissful experience, and then I turn around and it's gone. And so the only thing that is left is how I approach 
each new moment? How can I have that attitude that is more embraceive of situations? So um, Karen mentioned about just uh, being overwhelmed, having an experience and just uh, not knowing how to center oneself. And uh, in my life, I've learned that uh, another uh, useful saying, I actually don't know who said it, but uh, there is the saying that uh, suffering is uh, pain multiplied by resistance. Mm. So then having some kind of experience, and I've learned from myself to recognize it as a cue to let it in, not to resist, not to try to avoid and escape and cover up. And then the only way out is through. That, that is something that I found to be very meaningful in my life. So and that's I a great that. point, because um, there is a lot of resistance on my end. But how do you let it in? How do you, how do you let go? How do you let go and let it in so you can go through it? And I'm not, um, I've learned not to run away from pain. Like I know every time I'm in pain, there is something going on in my life that I need to address or look at. So, but how do I just let it in? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can just uh, add a little bit more, Joel. Um, yeah, that's not something that I found, again, just works instantaneously necessarily. I mean, sometimes it may if there has been a certain gestation process. But otherwise, uh, I shared a little bit about essential human qualities. So I can learn to be a little bit more patient. And I can learn to be a little bit more generous with the experiences that I'm having. And then gradually cultivate those qualities and to actually engage with them intentionally, to uh, be more kind, to actually relate with my own process, and then because of that, I can be more tolerant with others. And then to recognize that, yeah, all of those situations, especially the disturbing situations, so people in my life that really bother me, they help me to become a better human being. They, without them, I wouldn't learn how to be more patient. I wouldn't learn how to open my heart. There is this uh, very profound uh, prayer in the Tibetan culture that I also uh, have been working with throughout the years. And this prayer uh, is something that is very, how to say, uh, unusual in our today's world. The prayer actually goes, may I witness and experience enough suffering in this life to awaken the heart of compassion. And to me, I interpreted it just enough. I don't want to experience, I don't want to beat myself up. I don't want to torture just enough to awaken that heart of compassion. And uh, I believe that that's also very relevant to what uh, Jesus Christ was uh, also practicing and sharing. That's great. Does that address your question, Kiran? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So next we have Kent. Kent asked, is there a tool or strategy or idea to assist us in trusting in spirit and allowing what's happening with more ease? Um, I have some thoughts, but Roman, what do you, what do you think? Mm, good, really good questions. I love it. I, I love that we are getting right to the point. Yes, actually, within uh, the indigenous traditions we work with, there is this practice of remembrance. And the practice of remembrance uh, has to do with uh, this tuning in into one's own life and seeing how all of the peak experiences in your life, all the most blissful moments, all of those situations when you experienced love, wellness, openness, connection, relatedness, those experiences, they were glimpses of who you truly are. And then of course, instead of relating to that on the level of a state of being, attaching that to those particular circumstances, hooking into those particular situations and thinking, no, that's only something that is available in those 
situations, in those experiences. Only when conditions come together in a particular way can I open up and experience that. But actually, those were just reaffirming glimpses of something that is always within us. Certain situations allow us to experience that in an easier way. But the point in these traditions is to actually bring those same states of being into every moment of our lives, whether difficult or challenging or easy. Whether I'm experiencing pain, whether I'm experiencing pleasure, the real happiness in these traditions is found in this capacity of the heart to be open with whatever happens. And so it's that happiness that is found in freedom to experience life. And it's this practice of remembrance, to really remember, okay, the spirit is not something out there. It's something that has been with each one of us since we've been born and even beforehand. And it's something that we can return to. And so there are practices that relate to it, not just as a, a way of just writing it down and mentally remembering it, but actually breathing it in going back into that situation and breathing it and allowing oneself to fully experience it again. And so then through that, being able to start trusting the spirit and seeing how the spirit is who you truly are. It's something we all strive towards happiness. I think it's safe to say that everyone, maybe different people have a different idea of how to get to that happiness. But happiness itself is something that is indescribable because each one of us knows deep inside what it feels like. Each one of us has experienced it. And that's the spirit. It's too simple for the complicated mind to understand. So yeah, I, that's what I can say short. <laughs> So, so to be clear, it's remembering the connected moments and reliving them so we can reconnect with spirit as often as we can. Yeah, absolutely. To remember that original state, this uh, original state of the unconditional love that each one of us has lived. We've all come through the mother's womb where the consciousness of the child and the consciousness of the mother were not separate, where all of the wishes have been instantly fulfilled, when there was this deep safety and peace and well-being and nurture in such a way where not a worry in the world, where it's possible to fully relax. And being in the mother's womb is not easy, right? You have to literally grow limbs. There are all kinds of growing pains. And at the same time, knowing that there is unconditional love to actually embrace you, to nurture you through all of the pains that you're going through in life. So that's something that is... Uh, relevant to the indigenous tradition and there are lineages uh, of direct transmission where people actually embody that state. Of course, each one of us knows that, each one of us has that seed, but then to allow that seed to sprout, to come into every situation. Otherwise, we all experience that and then as children, we meet this world that is not supportive of that state all kinds of circumstances that make us doubt in that original innocence and then closing down. So then coming to a point where it's possible to return into that fully consciously and to trust into that original state as the only reality, right? All the fears and doubts, it's just all of those uh, different uh, stories that don't have reality to them. We make them real by believing in them.
So we overcome doubt by remembering our connection. Definitely. Remembering that connection and learning how to extend the, the goodwill. And of course, initially, it's good to have certain memories. And it doesn't have to be something from early childhood. It can be maybe just yesterday or a moment ago, there was this glimpse. And then uh, tuning in into that, making that valuable in life. And so then, of course, it's not only about this um, experience, but it's a certain disposition, like I shared earlier. How can I develop my personality in a way that is more in tune with life? How can I cultivate an attitude in my life with everything that is happening that uh, is more... Um, uh, optimistic so to say and then of course uh, the next step in the remembrance practice there are different stages it's a very uh, profound spiritual discipline the initial st uh, stage is uh, described as finding an anchor so discovering remembering all of those situations in life that helped me to be more at ease that helped me relax that helped me open up and tuning in on the to the energetics of it. Okay, what, what was the energy of that? On the energetic level, I could be more kind, that could be more tolerant, I could be more patient, I could be more generous, I could be more at ease. And then the next step in that practice is uh, to bring that anchor of positivity into memories that were more challenging. And definitely it's good not to go into the worst possible trauma of one's life right away. But maybe yesterday somebody stepped on my toes and I got pissed off and I got triggered. And so I can remember that situation and maintain that anchor of openness. And it's not about a mental process of figuring out who was right and who was wrong. It's more about this capacity to deal with energy, to allow it to get through the body. In uh, transpersonal psychology, there is this term uh, repressed emotions or suppressed content. But where does it actually get suppressed? It gets suppressed in this body. The body takes over unprocessed emotions, all kinds of tensions, all kinds of issues that were not resolved. And so then this practice of remembrance allows the openness to move the energy. Otherwise, the energy is stuck and it's embedded by the scar tissue. So then mm -hmm. gradually learning how to soften around the scar tissue. Initially, I may still feel this tension. But at least I'm not going to make more tension with the tension that I'm feeling because that's not going to help. Right. So one of the main practices for me has been if I cannot relax with something, at least I can relax with not being able to relax with it. Ooh. That's an essential step, right? And so then in that way, it's softening, melting those barriers that have been erected over a lifetime. And I think that might correlate with what you were saying earlier, Roman, where you said working with energy in each moment, being a conduit, a conduit for each moment. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Kent, does that answer your, your question? Yes, thank you. I, I very much enjoy his perspective. Great. Um, I'll just quickly share because you particularly, what I love about your question in particular was with more ease. So my relationship with, with spirit and with love attraction and with God and with just my words create my reality sometimes really quickly and it's can be amazing and it can be scary so i manifested as some of you know i manifested crohn's in my body because ulcerative colitis the medication wasn't sufficient and i needed this medication the only reason i couldn't have access to it was because of my diagnosis and what doctors and insurance and blah 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 so i created crohn's very quickly in my body 
And I also got some of the nasties that you get with Crohn's like preanal this and microfissure that and fistula and all that. And I think the reason is I didn't ask with ease and grace or I didn't ask Crohn's or better. I kind of left it to the universe as Crohn's and I got all the negative shit that comes with Crohn's where I didn't get the light case, I got the heavy case. And so I don't know if that would have helped, but it seems true to me that if I would have asked for Crohn's or better, or with great, probably even better than asking for with grace and ease, asking for or better, I wouldn't have gotten some of the other nasties that I, I now am on a, <laughs> on a journey to heal in addition to this thing called Crohn's. So that might help you with the more ease part. Mm. Yes, thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think that's good for the moment. I'm just taking it all in. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Kent. And I just want to, Roman, in case you can't see, Kieran just said, Roman, your words are giving me goosebumps. What you were saying is so profound. Thank you. So that's, that's wonderful. For me, when I get goosebumps, it's like, it's truth bump. It's like, that's, that's true to my soul. And so I'm glad you're experiencing that. Um, Ina asks, please uh, share about your work in the Institute. And that reminds me, Roman, please also mention um, some of the online offerings you have. You know, we don't have to, it would be nice, it'd be, it's a welcome, it's an opportunity to fly to Peru and work with Roman, but there's also some online courses that are helpful on their own and also a prerequisite. And we'll be, um, I haven't yet, we haven't worked out the finances and stuff, but that'll, that'll come later. Um, he'll be part of the One Great Gut Network and you know, hopefully we can uh, collectively help others who are looking for, for deeper healing to have access to the medicine that Roman teaches and that he is a conduit and channel of. Um, so with mm. that, please, please share about your institute work. Mm, sure, well, first, uh, just to um, respond to Kieran, uh, thank you. And uh, also I find in my life that we all heal through each other and uh, it's this inner truth that we can recognize in each other's life and in each other's process. And uh, that's a big part of the healing journey and also of my work where, yeah, I have gone into full remission from Crohn um, 17 years ago, but uh, that was just the tip of the iceberg in my life where the healing went and continues going into more and more subtle layers and uh, it's this evolutionary healing and i'm grateful for that where uh, it's giving a sense of continuous purpose and meaning and a way to relate with others and a way to see myself in others and others in myself so that's a big part of my work in the institute basically and uh, our institute is a small grassroots organization and uh, we have uh, this uh, big uh, sanctuary reserve. It's about uh, 4,000 acres uh, bordering the National Reserve. It's a huge responsibility. And uh, the, the land is also a container for our intentional small community of people that are coming together where in our, in our organization uh, we have a saying where uh, it's uh, work, pray, and play together. <laughs> so where they're not separate from each other. And um, um, there are many different initiatives within our organization and uh, very few of us, so there is a lot for us to handle and I often have to wear many different hats. So I'm both a co-founder and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, executive director and uh, uh, just uh, dealing with tasks and I'm also loading trucks of supplies and uh, helping to build and plant and uh, uh, support people uh, who come to our re retreats and uh, continuously uh, looking for ways to really uh, share the living wisdom of 
uh, these ancestral traditions with people who are interested in them. And uh, these traditions they refer to as living wisdom traditions because it has to be living, it has to be alive. And those traditions wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for people just like you and me. People like us who were actually making a real decision to face challenges in life. So and in that way, awakening that wisdom uh, within. And so it's something that uh, has to do with everyone. And uh, within our organization, we are working with, we have a distance healing program. It's a three months program that has to do with uh, a, a nutritional program and um, uh, a dream work process that is based on the Ashwar dream work and transpersonal Jungian psychology helps to recognize the psychosomatic root of the health condition and uh, also life coaching. And so then uh, that program, uh, sometimes people choose just to go through that program. And we've had quite a few people that found that program to be very life changing for them. And uh, some people choose that program to be uh, Prerequisite. Well, we actually have that as a prerequisite for anyone with a health condition who wishes to come to our physical center to heal. And then uh, we're also working on um, more and more social media. We haven't been so technologically advanced. And so we've been taking that step forward and we are starting to make podcasts and uh, have a home study course that we are developing and uh, there are lots, lots of articles on our website in relation to this subject and many others. And um, it's not just healing of the illnesses that our institute is focusing on, but it is focusing on uh, transformation of consciousness, first and foremost. And then the illnesses and diseases, they are a natural part of that transformation and evolution. Sounds beautiful. Thank you. So people would come to you in groups, they would travel to you and work for a certain period of time, or it's like there's no timeline. How, how do you do that? Well, we have um, workshops and retreats throughout the year. And then we also have uh, uh, apprenticeship program where people stay with us throughout longer periods of time. And we have a uh, work study service program where people also come and stay with us and uh, live in our community. So we have different ways that people can interact with us. And we also uh, go on tours uh, now just once a year since uh, my child has been born two years ago. So we only go on tours once a year. We used to go twice, but now we go twi once, mostly to the US, but we are planning to also start going to Europe. Sounds awesome. a certain point. So Ina's in New Jersey, outside New York City. Are you, uh -huh. you have to come to the East Coast as well? Yeah, well, uh, my uh, mother lives in New York, in Brooklyn. So uh, especially now that I have a child, we go and visit the grandma. That's awesome. So yeah, I would love to, to meet when we are there. I think we'll oh, wow. be there sometime in June. It sounds exciting. My wife, she's the main organizer. I just tag along for the ride. <laughs> it's good to have a wife like that. I don't have a wife who could do that for me. <laughs> That's why I, it's, a, it's a joke in, in, within my friends. My best friend who's exceptional help for um, her husband's business. I'm like, I keep on telling him, you're lucky. My best friend is your, I wish I had her as a wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, we, we all do our part. Yeah. Roman, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I, before I interviewed you in 2015, I think it was, I watched the movie, The Sacred Science. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Did those individuals go through your online program before coming or was that not in existence back then? Um, it, the program was uh, in its early beginnings at that time and they did go through 
just uh, the basic preparation because of course going into a very harsh environment it's essential for people to uh, in our organization uh, it's essential for people to start developing that uh, motivation to actually awaken one's own inner healer instead of just this uh, more predominant um, modern mentality of okay just take me and operate on me fix me i don't need to do anything i don't want to know anything about it just fix me so this is something that we have to uh, prepare people with where people have to take responsibility for their own process people have to show initiative and face themselves and deal with uh, their shadows. A big part of our work is about shadow work. How to face one's fears, how to deal with everything that one has been running away from throughout most of one's life. And um, not to scoop things under the carpet. And then of course to have the container, to have the guidance, the support, the tools to go through that, but it's still nothing can substitute that. And so it's still up to each individual to, to bring that initiative. And so the program helps to prepare people towards that. Right. Ina, I didn't mean to cut you off, by the way. Did you have further questions uh, around the... No, no. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, let me, I'll just jump right in. So Jenny's next question. Um, thank you, Roman, for, for that. The online yeah course. yeah thank you everyone i really i really appreciate this conversation and yeah also just to share uh, uh yeah i I'm, I'm also i see how much meaning everyone is bringing just through going through their own process and also in and going through her process and i see how um yeah for me also all of the healing modalities that i'm working with and i'm also have uh, in, in this process in, in the Amazon rainforest, I ended up studying acupuncture and have become a Chinese medicine practitioner and also had to learn um, um, how to um, set bones within the Indian and Amazonian traditions and uh, how to work with many different aspects. And uh, it all came as a natural part of this inner healing journey, just seeing what is meaningful in my life, what is helpful, and then how I can share that with others. And so I do see everyone's participation here to be um, very essential, not just for people here, but for everyone our life is in contact with. Yeah. The breath work you teach, is that something that we can do a, a, a slight little bit here to give us a taste is that possible not so much <laughs> okay <laughs> uh the breath work that uh well of course yeah there are different uh, breath work techniques but um, there's a particular breath work um, um, ceremony that we work with and this breathwork ceremony comes from two very distinct modalities and cultures. One of them is from the Yanomami people in the Orinoco Basin in Brazil. And I've learned that modality from a Wutoto elder who himself uh, received it from the Yanomami elder. And um, uh, it is a ceremony. It is a practice that we do the... Uh, Amazonian practice, uh, once people do it with us, uh, people can do it in the comfort of their own homes. And we do have uh, a DVD that uh, takes people through the practice. Mm. The practice uh, entails breathing through the different uh, places in one's organism, through the different energy centers, and relating them with the different elements, different emotions, different feelings, learning how to shake whatever stagnation is in the body, how to loosen up and um, allow the energy to flow. And then the other modality that we work with uh, is a, 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 it's, it's a Tibetan-based uh, practice. And so uh, I initially received that practice from a, 
uh, Bonpo Dzogchen practitioner, which is a shamanic tradition in Tibet. And uh, the practice uh, is uh, very parallel to the Amazonian one. And over the years, we've been finding how one prepares you for the other. So the Tibetan practice, uh, the Tibetan based practice takes people much deeper. And in that practice, uh, the practice is based on reciprocity. The practice is based on this uh, capacity to feel oneself to be a part of a greater whole, not mm. to be stuck in one's own separate self. And at the same time, the practice encourages people to really face all of the problems in life, all of the pains, tensions, unresolved emotions, and at the same time, not to just deal with them on one's own as one little separate individual, but to bring that into that unconditional greater organism that allows all of those greatest tensions to be dissolved, like a drop of dirty water in an ocean of clear light. And so the practice can be quite cathartic. Often people have very powerful emotional releases or sometimes even going through this process of returning into the mother's womb, uh, having uh, all kinds of physical uh, experiences. Uh, and it's essential to have a life connection and support throughout that practice. And... Uh, at the same time, the practice, the focus of the practice is not catharsis. The focus of the practice is underneath all of those layers of problems, of trauma, of all of those different negative imprints in one's life. Discovering that original, innocent, tender, blissful, peaceful essence. Mm and then to learn how to channel. Initially, of course, it may come through as this uh, lightning in a bottle, this champagne bottle that just opens up and everything just spills out. But the practice teaches us how to learn to harness that energy. Of course, in our modern society, it's very popular today to have those cathartic modalities, right? This kind of uh, um, primal, release therapy, right? In New York, there's even those uh, special rooms where you go, you're giving a big baseball bat and all kinds of different things and you just break things. And definitely people feel a lot of relief as a result. But the problem with those kind of uh, practices is that if you are not conscious of how that disturbance is originating in the first place, if you cannot be fully present with it and you just get carried away, blown away by all of those emotions, right? I wasn't angry five minutes before. I will not be angry five minutes from now. But when the anger comes, I think that I am the anger. It takes over and it dominates me. And I do all kinds of silly things that I regret afterwards. And so in this ancient traditions, the point is to bring creative consciousness and to see how this energy is originating and how it can be channeled. So maybe this anger that I look at as something negative and I either push it away and suppress it or I totally react to it, but instead seeing, okay, it's energy. So maybe I can use this anger to go and do some hard manual labor or run a few laps around the house, right? If I feel envious or jealous, maybe I can go and wash a toilet with that energy. It can be applied to something that is useful, right? And so that's how these traditions work with that. We see that there is wisdom there, but I have to be present with it. If I just completely block it off or I totally get uh, enslaved by that energy, I cannot really see that wisdom. Got it. Can, can you speak to some of the medicines that you use? So I, I, that was the first thing that attracted me to, to you was, um, well, the first was the website that said you cured yourself of Crohn's. And then I associated that with, oh, oh, I can just drink ayahuasca and then I'll be cured. And rather than traveling to Peru, which I really was not in, uh, 
I was very much un more unhealthier then than I was now. Um, so then I found ayahuasca here in, in California. And I had um, three experiences uh, with that. Um, it did not cure me, of course. Um, so can you speak to some of the medicines you use and maybe some of the ones that we wouldn't be familiar with and maybe some of the ones that for the silliness of the American government, government that they've made it um, illicit and we have to leave the country to have access to maybe. Hmm. Okay, so that's uh, kind of a controversial subject. Um, yeah, often when people hear that I'm working with Amazonian and Andean traditions and the first thing that people uh, um, ask is, oh, so you're working with ayahuasca or you're working with San Pedro or um, all kinds of other uh, different uh, sacred plant medicines. But actually in the traditions that I've worked with, uh, that's not what it was all about. In our modern culture today is kind of a cherry picking culture. It's just takes one thing out of the greater whole, the greater context and thinks that that's what it's all about. But actually within the Amazonian tradition, within the Indian tradition, the sacred plants, they are instruments, they are tools and they have to be utilized skillfully and they, can, they cannot be just uh, engaged outside of the cultural context, outside of this remembrance practice that I shared earlier outside of getting real with oneself, having a motivation to really face one's issues and not cover, cover them up. Um, and so it's essential to approach those tools meaningfully, not just as a, some kind of once in a while um, psychedelic roller coaster experience, which Definitely today it ha it's becoming um, adapted to the Western mentality in that way, where people just want an experience. And then it's the same kind of consumerist mentality that comes in. But that's not how those traditions were meant to be utilized. And so when I came to the rainforest initially, the, um, I started working my first uh, healer. He was an el uh, Witoto elder. And he was more old school kind of healer. So the first thing he did was, he told me, okay, um, you have to wait. He put me in the hut and there were some other patients there, but he did not even give any remedies to me or others. And he would just observe. And he would notice me getting impatient and frustrated and then anxious and then starting to blame all my problems onto everything around me. And then he just said, okay, that's the, that's the root of your issue. The disease, that's just a symptom. The root of, your, of, of the real disease, the real issue is all of, the, are all of those emotions that you, are not, you don't know how to deal with in your life. Are you willing to take responsibility for that or not? And so then gradually, that's how the healing process started. And then after a while, he started to introduce, okay, how to engage with the remembrance practice, how to cultivate that anchor of openness and then bring it into more and more challenging situations so that the ceremony then would be a, a conscious endeavor, not just me going into something and then just getting blown away and then having no idea what happened and making all kinds of stories around that and no understanding of the language of nature. And so in this situation, it's essential to learn the alphabet, right? To learn the alphabet, essential human qualities, to see the principle of reciprocity, interconnectedness, how we are conduits of energy and not just egocentric, um, self-absorbed bubbles, right? So all of, all of that has to be established first. And so when people come to me, it's hard for me because it has become an industry today, unfortunately. 
and there's all kinds of ayahuasca spas and all kinds of things like that and and for me of course when i came to the amazon there were already all kinds of sideshow attractions like that but for me i was kind of being driven by death itself so to speak and so i could not really compromise and so I had to actually seek people who I felt were genuine and real and who went through their own issues and live side by side with them and not put them on a pedestal and actually relate to them as real people. And those were my real teachers. They were not people, they were not teachers because they had some kind of a title or paraphernalia that they were wearing, but because I could see them as real human beings and I could relate to them. And then I could see that same truth that I could recognize in myself, but on a much deeper level. And so, um, yeah, definitely there are lots of medicinal plants. And at the same time, it's that language. Each plant represents a certain quality, a certain characteristic. Uh, represents the, the plants is not what heals us human body is capable of the healing itself. The plants are recognized as keys that unlock that inherent potential. But uh, there has to be uh, that um, willingness already. So then the elder that I mentioned, he saw, okay, once I was ready to learn how to be more patient and making an effort in that direction, then certain plant medicines were given to me that would represent that quality of patience. But if I would just take those plants without the willingness to be patient, then it's not much different than the pharmaceutical industry. It just creates a certain side effect and then after a while it goes away. I, I really appreciate when you shared that you weren't giving anything and then you maybe started to complain or something and then the the response was well the impatience and so the metaphor the analogy that popped in my mind and is i don't know if anyone here has seen the movie the hebrew hammer and there's a scene where the actor goes to it's this whole it's a funny movie where i think it was andy dick he's trying he's trying to destroy hanukkah and so anyway, he, he's visiting the Jewish Justice League over in New York City. And to get through all the security and the top secret doors, he gets this one door and he can't get through. And it's just closed. He does let the eye or the finger or whatever, the fingerprint, and he still won't get through. And he loses it. And he starts complaining and bitching and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like the typical Jewish thing. He's a complainer. All right, he's obviously really a Jew. We're going to open the door and let him in. And it was this whole funny, funny loop, but the analogy being that they didn't force him to sit with the impatience and to get through the impatience. That was his access to the Jewish league versus you. It's very, very different the, to access as someone what is underneath this thing called impatience and how can we heal those emotions to more elevated emotions as Ina shared last week. Hmm. Um, okay, so Jenny had a question. I am curious about sensitive people living in a community culture that is not appreciative of those qualities. So then sensitive people end up feeling less than, not good enough, not measuring up to some standard that this sensitivity seems to create this illness, but also when embraced brings forth strengths and gifts that we might not have known we have. What are your thoughts on that, Roman? Hmm. I didn't know when I signed up for this that I'm going to be the one answering the questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we can throw out to the collective or I can address. Okay. You're, you're our guest speaker, so I threw it out to you. Um, this, so first of all, I guess, what does anyone list, anyone here, um, you know, it's, it's a mastermind, right? So we're all taking our collective minds to to help each other grow. Mm -hmm. um, so does anyone have any thoughts on what Jenny just shared? So Jenny, I'm gonna unmute you. Can you explain more? Um, so I understand, so you're curious about sensitive people. Oh, I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. So what is, what is your, what is your question? Well, I guess it's more of an observation that I've had is that, um, and I was just curious how, you know, uh, you know, how people would feel about it. It's just that there's a way in which we feel unacceptable, right? In, in the world, there's so much judgment and, you know, people have to be certain ways, you know, in the overall culture, like in our culture in the U S right. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variety, but there's a lot of pressure to be certain things in order to be successful or, you know what I'm saying? Maybe not. Does that not make sense? Well, it sounds to me that maybe you have a, a story in your mind of what success means and you're judging yourself. You're not living up to someone else's version of what that means. Well, I have my own issue with that, but I meant just in general, there's a lot of pressure on us as humans, you know, in a, in a culture that, you know, really is not very sensitive to people, specifics. There's, you know, there's like a generic idea of how we should be. And maybe I'm totally wrong. I've been living out in the woods for too long. <laughs> But no, do you know what I mean? There's a, there's, there's a, there's, I don't believe in wrong. So you're definitely not wrong or right. This oh, is just, yeah. your, this is, these are your thoughts, right? And, and they're real. They're, they're legit. This is what's actually going on in your mind. This is really, really valuable, but I'm trying to understand what the, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this has been my experience. So, and yet I, what I'm trying to say is, you're in a culture where uh, there are certain things that are expected, and if you feel like you can't live up to them in certain ways, you, you, might, you might, can you um, can you make it more tangible? Is there a specific example of something that you feel you're not living up to that in your mind or someone else's standards? Well, I mean, just being ill is an easy one. You can't you can't be normal. You're not functioning normally. You have all these issues, right? And so there's a way in which you don't you can't meet the standard that i actually i guess it has to do with self-esteem maybe who who, so standard, who who standard can't you meet what standard are you trying to meet when you're this thing called ill uh i don't know i mean if i i don't i'm not a big tv watcher but there's a way in which there is a generalized idea or put out there that is the way people should be it seems like mm. we, get, we, get all these, a... we get Go all ahead. these images we get all kinds of images we get all kinds of things yeah. coming at us all the time telling us who we should be in order to be got it, got it. Yeah, so in my if you've caught the first third of my tedx talk i i address that and in my opinion what that is is unconscious marketing which is 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 created right. to make us feel less than so then we will purchase something to feel more than and we're never going to feel more than from a purchase it doesn't right. come from buying a, a material thing i don't care if it's a scarf from target or a rolls royce from the dealer mm -hmm. like none of those things like things don't bring happiness right and so I, I'm, I'm wondering if is that what you're referring to because the media is like the unconscious media, like, so my challenge in my TEDx talk was to wake up the marketers, right? Because I'm in marketing and you have these, you learn these really psychological skills to help someone or to make someone or uh, persuade someone to make a decision. And maybe we should help people make decisions towards things that's helping humanity and growing the consciousness in the world and making yeah. you truly happy from the inside rather than some of the bullshit that they show us on TV. Does, does that address what you're referring to at all? Well, sure. I mean, I was making it kind of generalized. I wasn't trying to be specific. Like I said, I have some of these things. I have gone through my own process to realize that actually it doesn't matter. But I, I was just asking it in general for, um, I forgot your name already. <laughs> Out of out of brain Roman? fogness, Roman. Right? I was thinking, Roman, you might might have a comment about that because it's a. It, what I'm seeing, and tell me if I'm wrong, is it sounds like the communities that you're in are their emphasis is on something very different than the sort of mainstream 
we at least here have is telling you, you know, you have to look this way, you should do that. These are the things that do to be successful. This is what you do to be happy. I'm not saying people are really like that. I'm just saying it's. Yeah, it reminds me of so another shaman that I met, I think around the same time at Raman. His name is Kai Carell, and he spent a decade, he's also Israeli, and he spent a decade in a um, ashram in India. And uh -huh. I saw his talk at Burning Man, and he shared that he's only interested in things, activities, people's religions, whatever, that help you become more of what you already are, going back to the remembrance. Mm -hmm. And for me, my experience with Judaism, the way it was taught by my community and my parents was not that. It was taking me away from who I was and, put, and making me something else and feeling yeah. shameful for certain things I did. And so I really appreciated Kai's um, kind of education, him coming from a Jewish background and spending time in an India, a decade in an ashram so that's the way I've lived my life since. If, if people, activities, things, events, whatever, is, is not helping me become more of who I already am, more powerful that I, you know, and take me off my intuition, then it's not for me. It's not aligned for me. It throws me off. Does that help at all? Does that yeah, make sense? I mean, I, I agree with that totally. So I brought it up as a, I, something to talk about, really. <laughs> mm. I see. You know, just because I think there's a lot of people that are um, marginalized by feeling like they're not, they're not, they don't fit in, there's something wrong with them. And then if you have an illness, right, it's uh, exacerbated that way. So that's kind of where my, where I was coming from. <laughs> not doing it very graciously, but anyway. You know, you're doing it perfectly. And I really <laughs> love, I, I really appreciate your authentic share and your vulnerability. Like most people wouldn't say, oh, it's the brain fog. What was that man's name again? And, I, and, I, and that's, just, that's just real, right? And, and I appreciate that. And there's no shame. It's just, it's what is, right? So thank you. I really okay. I honor you for, for that truth. And, you know, it takes a lot of strength to share outside of, the Facebook highlight reel or the Instagram highlight reel yeah. that everyone is sharing, right? And here, Kent's, Kent's nodding with you. I can relate. I don't meet <laughs> society standards and pressure as well. And I, yeah. I, I, I agree, right? Like that's, the, that's one of the reasons I created One Great Gut as a place for all of us, sure, to get cured through One Great Gut Foundation, but really to be like, this is what is, this is what life is to live with, dot, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And I believe that my opinion is we were put on earth or we chose to come back to earth to help relive, um, to help educate others on this path and to show them maybe more compassion, empathy, and sensitivity, and to unwind the shame that might exist with this thing called, insert disease name, right? Whatever that might be and the, and the right. symptoms. And I think people like you and I are really helping others learn compassion and learn empathy and really how to be with others who don't have the same genes or mental thoughts or whatever it might be that others might, might have. And I believe that we're here to show people like what are healthy foods to eat Maybe the man-made foods that have been created for, for money in the name of GMOs and the name of processed foods. And, the, you know, I grew up on, Mica, what was it, uh, Lucky Charms and Twizzlers and Kit Kats and Michelina's um, Fettuccine Alfredo. I mean, like, there's no wonder I got this thing called ulcerative colitis. I kept, I, I bought into the man, right? And so now I'm learning, like, really true foods. Like, I would love if Romo cared to share what is he eat on a daily basis, you know, compared to us when we can go to the grocery store or go to Amazon or Thrive Market or something. So I believe those with IBD and those with any of these diseases are here on earth to show others what yeah. true food is, what true healing is, what true eating is, what true connection is and true love. Yeah. And I also think it is our own, um, our own you know, journey in a sense, on a level that's different, you know, that, but it's a, 
I guess you could say it's a kind of way showing. So there is, I mean, sure, I've had the shame and everything for other reasons too, but by trying, by lifting yourself out as much as you can out of your self in terms of talking about things with matter of fact and not making it a problem, but what you were saying, you know, with your, um, whatever your condition is, whatever it is to just be matter of fact and make jokes about it or whatever, right? It, it shifts things for other people who observe. So there's more of an awareness and maybe a, re, uh, maybe a reaction that would be, give them a little people, some people a little more ease in terms of how they experience their own things like that or see others. So, I mean, I guess I see it as a way of, it's a gift. It's a gift that you can give back, even though you might look like you're not able to do that, right? You know? There's, there's always, I find no matter how small life may feel or have gotten, there's always a way to give back and, and gift. It, it could be a simple text to a phone call to, to showing up to someone. There's, I find that there's, no matter how gnarly and bad things may seem, bad in quotes, there's always mm -hmm. someone worse. And yeah. I, I, that was one, my friend who visited me when I was in the hospital, Tomer, he, it was amazing getting the reflection back from him because I hadn't realized this, but his share to me was, Joel, I'm, I, I'm just amazed how much you have to give while you're in the hospital. And right. I feel like I'm, I'm, gonna, like I'm in service of others forever, right? And, and, and through boundaries, sharing with Kent shared, it's learning, you know, the boundary of to how much to share and with who, as we all try and lift up the planet from the current level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> that was basically what I wanted to talk about, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add anything to, to Jenny's comment? Okay. I can I can add a little bit. Please. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just to also respond to Jenny, I also forget people's names all the time. So. <laughs> um, and then, um, yeah, I do see that this path of awakening from the dream of separation mm -hmm. is uh, to go beyond those superficial appearances. And also to not uh, need to be someone in someone else's eyes. Mm. A lot of energy goes to that, is wasted on that. And so, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big part. And in our community, it's uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, we relate to this process is uh, Friends who love the truth more than each other. Yeah. And so it, it's it's something, of course, yeah, it's inevitable within any community that there will be conflicts and friction and disagreements, but at the same time to be willing to work through all of that. And maybe personally, I may be disturbed by someone or dislike someone, but that's just personally. I can get over myself. And I can learn how to open up more and how to actually, and, and I found out in my life that people that were uh, the most disturbing to me have become my best friends. Ah. Once, once I was able to really move through my own personal agenda and to really tune in at the heart of the matter beyond the personality. And so that's been a big part uh, of uh, my own journey and in our community. Yeah, it's essential. We call them creative frictions. Yeah. What before would be conflicts, interpersonal, they are creative frictions. They allow everyone to actually mature and get over themselves and step yeah. beyond those uh, artificial personality constructs and then to discover that universal essence that we can 
actually relate to. Yeah, that's right. That's great. That's very appropriate because I have, I'm in a small community uh, for, a, for about a year now that um, we're having that kind of thing show up right now where mm -hmm. there's a big conflict and how to deal with it. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. Mm. We also have uh, in our community, we have a set of community agreements mm. that uh, they are um, certain uh, guidelines that we can tune in. And they, we have an article on our website uh, in relation to that, but they are very simple guidelines, okay, to own one's own experience and to respect the experience of others, mm -hmm. to uh, honor one's true self, to uh, have responsibility and 100% integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, beyond words, once we start living with each other, we start seeing more and more deeply what that means in different situations. But to actually have a community where we come together based on those agreements has been very helpful yeah, in, in our community because then we can actually tune in into that. Well, yeah, no gossiping. That's one of them. Go to the source, right? And so when something happens, we can check in. Okay, well, have we been aligned with that? Mm -hmm. So then it's been very helpful to cultivate that. Yeah. And then stay the course. In the case mm -hmm. of this group, somebody left because they were upset, right? So, mm -hmm. I'm and I'm like, I don't, you know, that's a really that's a tough thing when they they their own emotional thing is they don't want to deal with it, so they leave. Or I would rather have them come back and have us do what you're talking about, kind mm -hmm. of work it out and see what it feels like and how can we yeah, yeah. work with this? Yeah. Every everyone are on their own path and yeah. journey. Yeah. And so then, yeah, it's also inevitable. Some people leave, some people come. But uh, that's also something that can be actually brought forth in the beginning. Okay, we are here to work through our disturbing emotions. Yeah. Yes, things will come up. It's essential. We're going to live in community. Inevitably, things will come up. So instead of tr trying to pretend like nothing is happening and tiptoeing on the eggshells, actually, no, let's confront the issues let's have the appropriate tools and attitude and willingness to actually go through the situations that allow us to really break through all of those different elaborate self-deceptions yeah perfect <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna take notes and share it with my group thank you that's that's great yeah i have to say living in community has been one of the most profound um experiences of spiritual growth for me because yeah i cannot hide mm -hmm. you know people are blowing my cover left and right mm -hmm. and i'm grateful for that <laughs> yeah because then i can actually become more honest and authentic and see where i actually need to practice well and and you probably have better uh, closer relationships as a result, right? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Much, Much more, more real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, Jenny, I live here in an intentional community and one of the tenants is nonviolent communication. And um, it's really up leveled my game. And like Roman said, I, I, you can't hide. Like, yeah, I have my own cottage here from the main house because I wanted more space, but mm -hmm. um, we have, heart shares, which are basically, you know, community meetings. And there was one woman who, who was living here for, I think a good number, maybe a year or so. Before, and um, she was triggered from something that occurred. And it was words between someone and her. It was even a guest here. And it was the coffin in the, I mean, she, she left the community after that. And she couldn't come to even having a conversation around it. And so, um, you know, we, we all wished her well, and she's an amazing woman. She was actually a doctor, and um, she sent us a text just recently and how grateful she was for the growth and experience that she had while here, and it was very different than the energy that she left with. And so, uh -huh. so every, everyone's on their own path, and they go through their own journey, um, but hopefully, you know, I believe in the model, leave them better than you found them, and I, I really strive to, <laughs> to, to do that as much as I can. Um, 
Maybe. Yeah, and I went to a talk, I don't know if you, who follows me on Facebook, but I went to a talk last night of um, uh, a Tibetan meditation master who moved to the United States and he gave a talk on understanding karma. And it relates exactly to what Roman just shared as far as, you know, um, cultivating more good karma in the world, which I'm hoping we all believe in karma, um, is honoring our word and our agreements that we have with other individuals. And maybe even further, I didn't even think about this until now, but agreements that we have with ourself. As yeah, we, you know, <laughs> we tell ourselves we're gonna do something and then, you know, I don't know, is that in the karma, that wasn't part of the conversation last night, but right now it's popping on my mind. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that. Um, I know we're kind of wrapping up here anyway, but I was, it's interesting the power of our word and how we have on others and ourselves and how it relates to karma and maybe the more good karma we have the more goodness comes to us is what i believe and maybe the first level of the afterlife as i'm reading this this book maybe a easier ride through the lower levels as we go towards the higher levels in in the afterlife mm. But you're, that's really great that you brought up the individual thing because it's really easy for me anyway to try to please others. That's kind of how I was brought up, right? You're supposed to please everybody. But actually living up to my own, sometimes it's much more difficult. You know, my own like, oh, I, I would like to be this way or I should be that way or you know what I mean? And then not living up to what I think I want because of... Oh, maybe, maybe the first individual you should please is yourself. Yeah, right. It's, it's, a, it's like Ina, Ina shared last week. It's not selfish. Keeping yourself first. You know, I, I think that there are certain individuals who, if you told them that, it might, it might cause a lot of ego issues. But I think those who are blessed with this thing called disease, if you are inviting them to the possibility of being selfish, I don't think it'll ever be so balanced <laughs> that you're truly like what selfish means in the scope of, you know, what we see in the media or the movies of the world, right? Like because we're maybe more likely to be a people pleaser as we slowly shift to being selfish, it's really more of a karmic balance versus becoming selfish as we might see some other individuals. Sure. So right. maybe take care, take care of yourself. Be, just take care of yourself and put the mask on, just like in the air. In the, God forbid, the airplane goes down. You do that before you help others around you. True, but there's always internal stuff that where you play games with yourself. I do that anyway. I don't know. Maybe nobody else does it. <laughs> I think yeah. we all play games with ourselves for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I know it's getting late. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Has this been helpful for everyone? Anyone have a, a last comment before we say goodbye to Roman? What's been maybe most useful um, that we've learned today? Seth, how about you? You've been quiet, Seth. I'm going to unmute you. <laughs> uh, I think you have to unmute yourself as well. There you go. Uh, you can hear me? No, it's just um, hearing everybody's um, moments or way of expressing uh, the spirituality. Uh, it's, it's a new um, look on, on life, and I really um, <clears throat> I'm a good listener, and um, it's just a breath of fresh air, and um, I'm going to digest it, and uh, it's it's just a, another growing opportunity. It's just um, I'm going to. Uh, look into uh, Roman's website and, and um, just explore uh, new avenues. You know, just, um, you know, it's a good learning experience and I just have to digest everything. It's, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, Roman, I, thank you for all the, the speech and uh, it's all good stuff. Mm. <laughs> what is your website or what is the name of your website, Roman, of your or institute? It's uh, Paititi uh, dash institute.org. So P A I T I T I, Paititi. Okay. Dash institute.org. Okay, thank you. And I put it in the uh, 
comment oh, in the chat yeah. window as well. So you can just click on that. Okay, got it. Thank you. Eventually, it'll be part of One Great Gut, so to make it easier for people. But for now, just go directly there. Um, how about you, Cassandra? Do you have any? I'm going to unmute you. What, what do you think? How are you <laughs> feeling? Um, I really appreciate, Roman, all of your insights and perspectives. Um, it's, it, this aspect of, of healing is, is something that is really important to me, and I'm just very grateful to be part of this group, even though I don't say a lot. I'm grateful you're here. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, sorry, grateful. Elsa. I'm grateful that you're here. And um, I know it's more challenging because you're on the phone and not in a webcam, so you can't see us. But I really appreciate you pushing through that and, and staying here with us. And I'm glad that you got a lot of value from, from this call. Thank you. So the last thing I want to I want to mention everyone is, um, I don't know, Roman, are you familiar with Gene Keys or Play Akasha? I am familiar with Gene Keys, actually a very dear friend of mine. He is uh, on the uh, Gene Keys team and he's been uh, for years uh, helping them with their running the courses. Uh, Richard uh, Rudd, right, is the founder and then uh, my friend Elijah. Uh, he's been working alongside Richard and he designed their website, helped to develop the uh, cards and uh, works very deeply with the gene key community so he's a very dear friend of ours and he's also trying to create a bridge between Paititi and gene key community oh, and uh, have so, you yeah, heard so of play, have you heard of um the assemblage in new york city and their website play akasha we've done a talk in assemblage our, on our last tour and uh, my friend Elijah, he's been the one who has been collaborating uh, with Assemblage on behalf of Gene Keys. Great. So I don't so, know much else about them. Okay. But so uh, everyone, my understanding of uh, Assemblage, it's it's this um, it's a conscious work center, uh, work um, like a co-working space and a cafe, a whole lot of more in New York City, in. Mm -hmm. They're also aligned with with gene keys. So gene keys is something related to astrology, and it's maybe a, a system to learn for, uh, to learn more, to activate more, lift your consciousness, and really see things in the the, the lessons that he's taught. At the end of the day, it's like a 500 page of book, and I'm not great with books of that length. So. I just put in the chat, there's a uh, website called Play Akasha. And so that's the homework for the next week. And I'll tell you what Play Akasha is. It's my understanding is it's gene keys in this, um, basically in, uh, I don't wanna say a course, but it's different meditations that Richard and others have created, which unlock certain of the keys. And it's really like, it's 100% free and I'll sometimes get emails, I'll sometimes get text messages. So I wanna to read to you that last text message I got because it's, it's just so on point. Um, it came from the Oracle. They, they call it the Oracle. Um, yeah, the Oracle Game of Life. So this is specifically for me and it's, so this came in on Friday morning. The Oracle has another clue for you to comp contemplate difference between weakness and equality is respect. When humanity can remember how to respect one another, just as individuals learn to respect both the heart and the mind in their own life, communities will grow to thrive and grow together. And that's, I'm currently in the gene key of my own personal weakness and how, as I see equality in others and myself, it helps maybe not suppress, but transmute the quality of a weakness. And I know that context doesn't really make sense without having gone through it, but you know, meditation's been a, a huge part of my journey and they just give you these nice guided, very short meditations. So please everyone just jump on there. I have no relationship with them, but I really um, jive with their teachings. Um, and I'm curious to see what, in a week, I don't know what's gonna unlock, but it's been a couple months as they open different um, levels. Um, but it, they, you can do it on the phone or on the computer and then you'll start getting messages. So please check out 
play a kasha. I don't know. Have you studied gene keys much, Roman? What What are your does it resonate with with you and your spiritual growth? Well, because uh, Elijah is such a dear friend, so Nach he's been through quite a few of our retreats over the years, and he's been just sharing that through his being. So uh, just through him, I've been uh, tuning in into that work. My wife, she's a lot more into it. Uh, I do uh, resonate and relate a lot with it. And um, um, it's just in in my life and my line of work, uh, again, there is that balance between the heart and the mind. And... Uh, working with the living wisdom lineages and uh, indigenous traditions um, it's sometimes uh, the main focus i mean it's often the main focus but uh, i have had an opportunity to look through the gene keys and uh, i do resonate with that perspective of transforming the shadow into the everyday um, functional process and then into the highest potential of that wisdom. So Richard uh, Rod, uh, because also my life, uh, in my life I have been, since the beginning, even before I came to the Amazon, I've been uh, uh, introduced into a Tibetan uh, lineage and I have been working with a particular Tibetan lineage and uh, with uh, the teachers of that lineage ever since. And um, Richard Rudd, he also recognizes how his work came through the uh, um, I Ching and the Tibetan wisdom and uh, certain uh, indigenous traditions. So it's very much in line with that. Great. Yeah, I just I remember. So play Akasha, the website, it says, we invite you to an interactive game that explores your life's calling, your gifts and challenges, and how you can best show up in the world for your community. And that's the way I relate to that, um, that free offering that, that they have. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. So if anyone's interested, um, I'm going to uh, put, actually, Roman, I'll also add you to the Mastermind Facebook group. There's no conversation there, but at least everyone will have direct access to you there. Um, or there hasn't been conversation yet. There's no reason why it can't open up. Um, and I'll put your website there as well. If you have any interest in any of his um, life coaching, the online courses, or uh, you know, even a, a trip to Peru, or even um, getting on his email list for his uh, United States tour coming up, I guess next summer it sounded, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going to be, we're going to go on tour. Uh, we pass through... Um different states and uh, the schedule i think it's already up on our site and we'll also be in california we'll have a breathwork retreat in hot springs uh near nevada city i believe so um can't yeah. maybe we can make the trip up there and, and check that out um uh, kent and i are both in california um uh -huh. i definitely would love to experience your, your teachings and, and meet you in, in, in person. Um, and as I mentioned, if it wasn't obvious, Roman will have some sort of formal relationship with the One Great Gut Foundation. So any, any, anyone from One Great Gut will have, um, it'll help bring funds to help us cure um, Crohn's and colitis. Somehow we'll have that um, as well. As the One Great Gut Network is turning out to be a directory of two things. So one, helpful health practitioners who specifically have made great strides with particularly IBD, because I think there's a lot of health practitioners who maybe are best at prescribing medication or maybe they're best at just marketing, but I want practitioners who are really good at providing results. And then also, um, those with IBD who have created businesses will be in there as well. And so I'm chatting with a bunch of different companies right now. Ina being a functional medicine practitioner, she'll obviously be part of there. There's a probiotic company started by someone I'm chatting with, photographers I'm chatting with, marketers. Just, you know, it's, it's a big deal for me to support others 
who have this gift called IBD and how can we really bring us all together so we can all lift each other up? Because as we know, it's a very expensive and time consuming undertaking. And I believe if we're all kind of helping each other through community, we're gonna help lift us through what is normally seen as something very challenging. Um, so with that, I know it's late. It's getting eight o'clock here in San Diego, 11 o'clock in New York and Peru and uh, where Kiran and Roman is. So thanks everyone for, for being here. I really appreciate everyone's time and wisdom and, and sharing and um, same bat channel, same time a week from now. I don't have, I don't know who the guest is yet, but I promised you it'll be someone great. Mm, thank you so much, Joel. Also, thank I just you. want to express gratitude for your work and your dedication in life. And uh, yeah, this is not something that I, meet very often is this willingness to really get to the root and not just to treat symptoms and to engage in uh, this uh, shared awakening. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank, thank you, Roman. I, I appreciate that. I mean, just yesterday I met someone who knows someone who has Crohn's and they're like, what should they do? Who should they go see? I'm like, I, I don't know. Let's jump on a call and find out. You know, there's so many possibilities of, but it really depends what is your soul asking for, you know, of who can I refer them to. I know so many practitioners, but it, it starts with what your soul wants and what you believe is going to be helpful. And if those two, if once those two things are there, the access opens up a lot quicker to the next step, next level. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm, gra I'm grateful for you as well and everyone who showed up because if you guys weren't here, Rome and I would be just pulling our thumbs and having nothing to do. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Make it a great week. Love you guys. Yeah. Love okay, you. much love to everyone. Take care. God Take bless. Care. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks. Good night.